This episode is sponsored by Interactive Brokers. Let's take your research to the next level with Interactive Brokers redesigned Fundamentals Explorer. Fundamentals Explorer provides comprehensive worldwide fundamentals data to all IBKR clients at no cost. More than 30,000 companies covered worldwide with 300 and actually more than 300 data points per company and over 80 sources for news wires and reports. The Fundamentals Explorer lets you dive deep, deep into hundreds of data points covering historical trends, industry comparisons, key ratios, forecast ratings, ownership, and more, so that you can see the whole picture. It also now includes a securities lending dashboard that provides complementary and premium security lending analytics. Use daily short sale data on thousands of securities worldwide to generate trade ideas, gauge short sentiment, and evaluate your portfolio from a different angle. Find data faster, add depth to your trading analysis, and compare beyond plain numbers. Better research, better decisions. Visit IBKR.com. Interactive Brokers is a member of SIPC. The Disciplined Investor is all about you, your money, and the markets. Sit back and get ready for this edition of the Disciplined Investor Podcast. This episode of The Disciplined Investor is sponsored by Horowitz & Company. If you're looking for a portfolio manager, look no further. Horowitz & Company. From seed through harvest, cultivating financial success. Conflicting data, but absolute certainty. What was in is now out. A rotation at the start of the year. The 10-year yield tops 4% for a moment, looking like a key resistance point. And our guest is Sam Byrne, CFA. He's the chief strategist at Mill Street Research. All this and much more on episode number 850 of the Disciplined Investor Podcast. Well, let's rig in the new year, 2024. Here we are. It's exciting. Well, for maybe for us, but not so much for the market. Oh, man. Once of the, one of the worst starts of the year in a while, actually. Interesting how that is after such a nice run-up. It's almost like a reflection mirror upside down from where we were in 2022 and leading into 2023, whereas the sentiment was so negative. It was awful. It was ghastly throughout 2022. A little bit of a respite starting in October of 2022, if you remember. But what happened from there? What happened is that things got really crazy, right? Things got really exciting. The sentiment turned so negative that there was just this buying spree towards the end of the year. And then all of a sudden, as that clock struck midnight and everybody came back to their trading desks on the first trading day of 2023, bam, wow, fantastic. Just an absolute wondrous year overall. A couple of areas of ups and downs, but if nothing else, let's take away everything. Let's just talk about November and December of 2023, which was fantastic. Just fantastic. So we're going to talk about that a bit. Me? Who am I? Andrew Horowitz. I'm the president of Horowitz Company. I'm the host of this podcast. We've been doing this for about 15 years or so. One of the original, the OGs, as they say, of podcasting. Back in the days when somebody mentioned a podcast, and I'm like, hey, 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 what's a podcast? You know, you remember those days, right? Remember the first time you heard, hey, have you listened to that podcast? You're like, uh, uh what, what do you mean? What, what's a podcast? But yeah, I started out way back. Thank you to Apple for all the support they gave me back in the day. Uh, all the help from uh, my good friends, um, with, with John C. Dvorak, of course, in the beginning, and, and Adam Curry. Everybody that helped me out along the way, and the companies, the people, the designers, the people that, that helped us put together, um, you know, various music and intros over the years, and they keep on doing such a great job. Thank you for that. But I'm also president of Horowitz Company. We're an investment advisory firm, and we actually manage money. So what we talk about today and last week and next week is not academic. It's not from a book. It's real life, boots on the grounds. You know, th th this, is, this is in the trenches what we deal with on a regular basis. 
I mean, what we saw last week, not unexpected, not great, not thrilling for people who are long, I'm sure. But generally speaking, when we look at, you know, the reality of the overbought situation that occurred throughout the end of 2023 and probably why it was and why is that? Well, probably some of the things that happened were that a lot of people had pent up gains, didn't want to sell it, but did want to reduce down and trim their portfolio to rebalance. So decided, you know what? If I sell it in January, I don't have to pay it for 14, 15 months later, at least. The taxes, that is, the capital gains. If I sell it in December, I got to pay in April, May. Why would I want to do that? So that's what is going on with that. We have a, a guest that's going to come on today and talk about a lot about that, but that's where we are. Where, 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 where do we begin 2024? You know, for weeks into 2000. Into the end of 2023, we talked about how, you know, markets are just all jizzed up about the, the Fed. And the Fed's going to reduce rates and, and, and the economy is slowing down. And what that means is more stimulus. And, you know, they were talking about, you know, the expectation of four, five, six different rate cuts into 2025. Probably the majority of them starting in about March of 2024. And everybody's all excited. And I kept on saying, I don't really know. Eh, doesn't seem as logical to me that that's going to happen because if you think about it, well, uh, the reality is that the Fed doesn't want to make a real big policy mistake. It didn't seem like a big possibility to have all that built into the markets already. But you know what? Narratives get started and we get the sheeps a herding and you get the, uh, the, the people on the bull side and everybody gets all in a lather and all excited and just follows right along. But you know, you know, when you look at what's going on, clearly that the there is this Goldilocks, I guess we'll call it, or maybe a, a just right, uh, the potential for a soft landing. Any of the terms you want to use to describe what's going on, what we see that right now is, at least from what I see, is that we have a strong economy with some weakness. I know that sounds weird, but we have a strong economy with some underlying weakness. That's kind of good. Because it all depends on where we have the weakness or where we have the strength. It's dependent on what the Fed is going to do. And everybody is so enamored, infatuated with everything the Fed does that we're looking at some of the areas that the Fed is going to look at as well. And they are going to potentially cut. Yeah. Again, I don't think as much. Wage growth in the latest report that we saw Friday, the, infl the, uh, un um, the employment report, the official employment report, wage growth was still there. So we have some strong numbers, but not too strong. You know, a little bit better on the unemployment rate uh, than expected. In other words, it was lower. A little bit more people hired than expected. So it was, that's, that's strong. But when we look at what we also saw on Friday, and when we combine some of the manufacturing numbers that we have out there, not so good. We saw the ISM services or the old ISM non-manufacturing that actually just came in just above 50. And when I looked at that, I was like, ah, that's interesting. That 50 line, quite surprising because that was part of the economy that was supposed to maintain strong. That was the economy that was humming, you know, as I call it, the Instagram or TikTok economy. That's something I've been talking about for a while. That part of the economy was better than the plumbing and fixtures and furniture part of the economy. But now they're both coming together and showing it that there is a contraction in the economy. When we look at the economy of the U.S., about 70% services and about 30% of manufacturing. When we put that together and we look at the manufacturing numbers at 30% and the service number at 70%, we are now under 50, that demarcation line between expansion and contraction. And this is the first time since 2020 when we had, of course, that great slowdown due to a forced closure of the economies, not only here, but around the world. And before that, it's been years. So we think about, are we going to go into a recession? Are we going to have a soft landing? Uh, you know what? This is painting a pretty different picture than what we see. We are seeing the major components of what we look at the economy in terms of what's going to happen forward looking is starting to show some weakness. Now, now we also saw in, in 2024, the best of breed do a U-turn which again, it seems a little bit reasonable that that, that would happen considering all the things that we know and what happened with, with involvement in the, um, you know, right now with, with 
the, the big move that they had, oversized, outsized, humongous move that we saw into the end of 2023. So the valuations, I think, is a problem in the U.S., particularly in some sectors, not everywhere. And, and I think there's some other areas that we should start thinking about into 2024, in my opinion, at least. But don't let's not just listen to me. How about we get to our guest? Before we do that, I want to mention, just for a moment, Interactive Brokers. Because Interactive Brokers has key competitive advantages for sophisticated investors like you. Interactive Brokers charges margin loan rates in U.S. dollars from 5.83% to 6.83% and rated the lowest margin fees by stockbrokers.com. Their clients can also earn extra income by lending their fully paid shares of stocks. And it's really easy. Join Interactive Brokers clients from over 200 countries and territories to invest in stocks and equities and options and futures and bonds, funds on 150 global markets. Of course, rates are subject to change. The best informed investors choose interactive brokers. I want you to learn more. Go to ibkr.com slash compare. And our guest today is Sam Burns. He's a CFA, which is a chartered financial analyst, which by the way, is a very, uh, it's prestigious. It takes a lot to get that. He's a chief strategist with Mill Street Research, an independent research company specializing in proprietary institutional research tools for asset allocation, stock selection, macroeconomic indicators. We'll get into all that. But he's been also, uh, he's had, he's had um, more than 20 years of experience as a market strategist, as I say, a youngster, uh, providing U.S. and global investment insights, as well as Wall Street firms, including Oppenheimer, Brown Brothers, Harriman, State Street, Global Markets, Ned Davis, and uh, it's good to have you back on. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. No, thanks for having me back on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's, uh, this is, we're, we're breaking ground, man. We're breaking ground. It's 2024. You know, we have that invisible but very important line of last year and this year. What happens before the clock hits, you know, 12 um, AM in the morning or, you know, uh, the new year strikes versus the, the year before. I mean, last year, when I, when I mean last year, actually, let, let's go back two years, 2022, misery, people upset, horrible. October 12th, that, that just puke low. Everybody was freaking out. And then it started to come back a little bit. Everybody's like, okay, well, you know what? It had to come back from these quote over oversold levels and into the end of the year, and, and kind of almost on clockwork, I think it was October 22nd this year, well, last year, 2023, is when things started to all of a sudden get a little bit better. And everybody was all excited again that, wow, total differential when it looked when we look at the sentiment of 2023, from 2022 to 2000, coming into 2023, 2023 coming into 2024. So with that as the... Backdrop, my friend. Um, where were you kind of uh, last year and, and where are we going into this year? And then we can start the conversation there. Sure. Yeah. And, and you're right. I think that the big story last year, you know, coming into the this time last year was that, you know, most everyone I certainly talked to uh, was, was still very bearish. Uh, a lot of negativity, a lot of expectations of recession happening in 2023 uh, or that earnings were going to fall, uh, that the Fed was going to be raising rates aggressively. That would slow the economy dramatically. And that uh, and that we'd be you know we'd be back in recession here pretty soon, mm -hmm. and uh, you know this is a big story was that you know that didn't happen. Um, things turned out much better than expectations were, um, and so you had both the fact that things are reasonably good, but also that the expectations were so low that you know beating them really was able to kind of push stocks higher and and surprise a lot of people. And so you had particularly after first and second quarter uh, earnings reports came out. Uh, you had big upgrades from analysts that had to raise their earnings estimates because uh, they'd been too cautious uh, coming into the year and even in the first half of the year. So as we kind of got further along in the year, um, those kind of concerns kind of came and went. Over the summer, you had more worries about interest rates and inflation. And then as we got into October, November, uh, started to look like that was going to fade. And now it looks like people have kind of adjusted uh, to the fact that inflation really isn't going to be a problem. Uh, the Fed won't have to raise any rates anymore than they have and might cut this, this this year. And I think that's been the shift is, is um, the investor sentiment uh, and expectations have caught up to kind of where reality has been. 
Um, and that's going to make it a little harder to beat expectations this year. But I think that things will still generally be okay in terms of earnings in the economy. So uh, it won't be such a matter of uh, things being bad. It'd just be harder to beat uh, higher expectations. All right. Lots lot unpacked there. First of all, people believe that inflation is not going to be a problem. I'm taking a piece of chewed gum, sticking it on a piece of paper, writing down and sticking that on my wall right now. We're going to get back to that in a second. Okay. Um, yep. But with regard to what has gone on, and and I think to sum up what, you, what, what you're saying was that sentiment turned to negative. People had an outlook that was just too glum, and we kind of hopped over that low bar, and everybody was relieved. Would that be a good summation right there? Yeah, no, that's right. I think everyone was really negative, and uh, so it wouldn't have taken much to, to beat ex those expectations because they were very low. And, you know, in the event, it turned out even better, I think, um, and then most people, you know, would have even hoped for, given what was going on in the world and what we see, have actually seen in places like Europe or China, other parts of the world that have not done nearly as well as the U.S. has. So I think it's been both uh, things were better than, than low expectations and the U.S., um, you know, outperformed even historical precedent uh, in terms of the, the performance of the economy and earnings uh, in 2023. But with that now, uh, it, you follow the Citigroup, Citibank, Citicorp. Economic Surprise Index, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. And, and what I've always gleaned out of that was that that economic uh, economists are full of shit. Uh, and what I mean by that is that all they do is adjust along the way to make it so they get closer to consensus or reality. And when the, what happens is they get too negative, that's the time that you always want to say, wait a second, that's actually an interesting time because they try to adjust and they're late and they get into the cycle late. They overshoot both on the up and the downside. Always seems to me to be a, a time when you want to wake up and say, ah, you know what? They probably have adjusted down too much and the surprise factors are going to be beneficial from an economic standpoint. And I think we could translate that probably to analysts that are changing their stock prices and outlook as well. Would you... That, that's kind of the game that's being played, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that, that is very often the case that uh, particularly when you have really big kind of dramatic moves in the economy or earnings like we've seen over the last two or three years post-COVID, um, those kind of moves are really, you know, tough for economists and analysts to, to keep up with in, in kind of the macro sense. Um, and so while I do think that uh, analyst earnings estimate changes are still a, a relevant metric because they, they capture the new news, the deltas, um, the the actual kind of price targets and, and ratings and things like that do tend to be lagged. Uh, they, they tend to come, you know, kind of after things have happened. And so uh, they're much less useful from a forecasting standpoint. But yeah, you're right. It's all about, you know, what are, what are the, uh, what is the outcome going to be relative to expectations? And if it's better than expectations, it doesn't have to be great. It just has to be better than expected. And that's kind of a lot of what we, what we had uh, last year. Um, and so I think that's going to be the, the the question this year is, can we do better than expected or is it going to be more something closer to expectations, given that expectations are a little higher now? And I think there's a really good teaching moment for those that are listening. And I think the, the teaching point that we really want to focus in on is the idea that what is actually happening does not necessarily mean that is going to be the response with stock prices. Hmm. And we've seen that with things like wars. The build up to a war, things get crushed and then the war happens. And then it's like, like what's happening in Israel, right? The build up to a war, Israeli stocks get crushed and now they're right back to where they are. And you're like, wait, it's worse than ever. How is that possible? And it's the same thing with regard to what is happening with companies in totality. But also you've seen this concept that when a new CEO comes in, he throws in the worst, the kitchen sink move on all the bad things that are happening. You got layoffs going on. He's miserable or she's miserable in a conference call. And all of a sudden the stock goes up because people are like, you know what? They're just exhausting every possible bad thing that could go on. And where does it go from here? So the teaching moment, and tell me if you agree, is it, it's, it's, it's skate to where the puck is going, not where it is. Oh yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Um, that you have to kind of look look forward. The stock market is, is is always trying to look ahead, and that's why people are often confused by you know they get some sort of economic news, and then they see the stock market kind of seemingly do the opposite, and they say, well, why would that be? Well, yeah, it's because they're 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 looking for what's coming next, not what just happened. And often, you know, the market and the or the economy is also kind of 
cyclical and, you know, a piece of bad news comes followed by a piece of good news. And so there, there's a, a tendency to, to over extrapolate whatever you've seen just recently. And we see that in investor surveys. We see that in, you know, economist forecasts and analyst forecasts and in just the way investors behave. And so that's that's what you got to do is avoid kind of, you know, getting caught up in what you see in the headlines today and, and have some sort of a, a structure or a plan or way to analyze the market that keeps you from uh, getting kind of sucked into those, uh, uh, you know, kind of news driven headlines that will get you off off course. So now as a chief strategist um, for Mill Street Research, where were you uh, generally now? I'm talking big picture, very big picture. Where where were you positioned 2023 overall? You know, I'm not saying in any particular month, but the big picture, you know, from stocks, bonds and then break it down U.S., non-U.S., uh, maybe uh, alternatives. Uh, I, I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever. What, what was the, the, the big overall and overarching allocation? Yeah, so basically in late 22 and early 23, um, I, I moved overweight equities and basically stayed overweight equities relative to fixed income all year and still am. Uh, I'm somewhat less overweight now than I was earlier in the year, but still favoring stocks over bonds. I've uh, been underweight bonds for probably three years now and uh, still am for the moment, uh, favoring kind of cash or the short end uh, relative to the long-term bonds just because long-term bonds have been so volatile and have had a, a terrible run up until just the last couple of months. So um, so it's definitely been a, a stocks over bonds and that was driven by the fact that if inflation was high but coming down um, and uh, the Fed was raising rates, uh, that's a scenario when um, you know, earnings are going to rise. That helps stocks. It does not help bonds. Um, and so that you're going to get, you know, much better results uh, in an equity uh, investment than in, in a fixed income investment. And that's what we saw pretty dramatically in 2023. Um, I have been favoring U.S. stocks over international stocks. And uh, again, that's, you know, the relative strength of the U.S. economy um, showing up there as well. Our earnings have been better in the U.S. than most other places. Um, and so a lot of work I do look is, looks at the evolution of earnings and estimates. And, uh, and we, I was seeing that all throughout 2023 that, sectors and industries and countries that it would not have been doing well if you thought there was a recession coming were doing well. Industrials, technology, consumer, those shouldn't be showing strong earnings revisions if you think you're going in right into a recession. And that's what I was saying earlier in the year. Um, so from a, both a kind of a bottom-up standpoint, but also kind of a macro standpoint, uh, it looked like things were not going to be as bad as everyone thought uh, at the beginning of, of 2023. And then it just kind of mostly followed that script uh, inflation wasn't going to be a problem. This is not the 1970s again, um, and that we're going to get back to kind of more pre-COVID type uh, economic environment as once the supply shocks kind of work their way through the system. So and that's what, that's kind of where we're at now. So for those for those people listening that heard all that, and they hear things like, "Hey, we're overweight or underweight equity." What does that compare to? Because you know, mm -hmm. it's like, "Oh, I'm overweight equities." Well, is it just your overweight equities compared to bonds, or is it just overweight compared to a benchmark? Is it overweight compared to just a simple 60-40? I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, roughly it's just sort of the 60-40. Uh, the, the kind of the, the traditional institutional benchmark is, you know, something like 60% stocks, maybe 30% bonds, and then 10% cash, something like that. And that's kind of the benchmark I use. So if I say, oh, I'm overweight, that means I'm more than 60% stocks, uh, so over the benchmark. And if I'm underweight bonds, that means I'm less than 30% bonds uh, in terms of, you know, an allocation relative to that benchmark. Now, obviously, everyone can have a different benchmark. So however that might translate to someone else's uh, specific portfolio can change, but um, that's the benchmark that I use and that's pretty typical for a lot of institutional investors. Um, so you see, yeah, so, you, so you're right, it can mean different things, but in my case, I was, you know, 75% equities um, uh, at the beginning of the year and, uh, and, and mostly held that through the, through the year until now I've backed off a little, now I'm 65%. Uh, relative to a sixty percent benchmark, so, so what about so, 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 you generally so can't get too far away? Yeah, that's 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 kind of right. where it's at. So what about bonds? I mean, we talk about your thirty percent uh, positioning, your forty percent, whatever it exactly is, right? Uh, how much of that is an asset allocation? Because I know you really focus on asset allocation too. How much of the asset allocation is, let's call it? There's a number of different variate. When I look at this, I start seeing starbursts uh, because I look at, I think about. Okay, we got U.S. Well, okay, what U.S.? You want corporates? You want uh, what level corporates? And then what, you know, what what duration do you want? What maturities do you want? And then you have things like, um, oh, well, we want foreign. Well, what part of foreign do you want? Do you want a hedge? Do you want a non-hedge? I mean, there's a, there's a very deep vat of potential positioning. It does the same thing in stocks to a degree, but bonds, really, you can go pretty deep and wide into 
um, differential. So, so how much of all of those things that I mentioned, or none of them, are part of some of the design work that you do when you're creating a portfolio? Oh yeah, you're. I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you can go as deep as you want into any of these uh, kind of subcategories of, of fixed income or of equities. Um, but yeah, uh, fixed income in particular has, has a lot of uh, nooks and crannies there, and I mostly try to keep it at a fairly high level, um, just because I'm not a, a I'm not trying to give you know bond portfolio managers very specific guidance. I'm really trying to get the big picture right, and it's really the two dimensions that I focus on are the duration, meaning do you want to be in long term bonds or short term bonds, and then credit which is basically, do you want to be in kind of more high yield, lower, you know, lower grade bonds that are riskier, or do you want to be in safer stuff, high grade uh, treasuries or AAA kind of, kind of bonds? Uh, most of the you know, kind of movements in the bond market can be explained by those two main drivers, you know, in my view. Everything else kind of is a secondary kind of offshoot of one of those. Um, so to me, uh, it's been more about focusing on the short end of the, uh, the duration curve. So, uh, you know, maybe three-month bills, two-year notes, those kind of things, rather than 10-year or 30-year bonds uh, for the last year, just because, one, um, you know, when the Fed's raising rates, it can be, you know, riskier to own long-term bonds, and um, that the uh, there's a lot more volatility in the long end. So you're taking a lot more price risk in owning a long-duration bond um, than you would be in the short end. And so you really need to make sure that you're going to get paid for that. And I didn't see the the prospect of really kind of getting paid for that extra risk uh, by taking long duration, particularly when the yield curve is inverted. I mean, you're getting a lower interest rate on a 10-year bond than on a, on a two-year bond or on a three-month treasury bill. So if you're getting a, a less yield and a lot more volatility, you really got to have a good reason to want to own those bonds. Yeah. Uh, yeah in other circumstances, well, the only that reason, might be the only, the only reason is that you want to take capital losses. Right, right. <laughs> Exactly. Right. I mean, that would be the and, and, and 2023 was a terrible year for terrible. bonds. 2022 was also a terrible year for bonds. And 2020 um, the worst in history. Actually 2023 the benchmark uh Bloomberg AG actually eked out a gain at the end. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess by the end of at the year the end, uh, at the end enough um to uh to, to to post a gain uh with with the big rally they had at, at the end of the year. Yep. Um so, no, so where are we it, now, yeah. though? But what about so, so? Let's get a little deeper. So I got the maturity and I got uh, credit. What about domestic international? So for the most part, I've been focused on domestic. Um, you know, looking at uh, U.S. either treasuries or or corporates. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, when you once you get into foreign um, fixed income, a lot of what you're doing is really making a currency bet. In, in many cases, um, now there's you know, obviously if you're investing in something like Japan, where interest rates are still very close to zero. You know, you do get a big yield differential. Um, it's less so, say, with you know Europe, where rates are lower, but but not as low as, as say in Japan. But you know, U.S. rates are relatively higher than most of the rest of the world still. And uh, which, by so the way, again, makes no sense. You, which makes no sense. Uh, well, right. Other than, I mean, I mean, the credit US economy quality have generally been better. Well, um, we could use the excuse that well, uh, the U.S. is doing better economically, so therefore. Uh, you know, the Fed had to raise rates and our rates are higher and blah, 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 because they're trying to slow down the economy and all that good stuff, right? However, you got to put in the mix there somewhere about the credit quality. The higher the credit quality, the lower yield, right? You know, I'm willing to pay, uh, for, in other words, junk versus sovereign. Junk should have a higher rate than sovereign. When you then look at emerging markets versus U.S., or y Europe, Europe's in a much, Germany's on the, on the verge of an implosion, Okay, and economically, and and the, and Europe, we know what the story is with the Europe. It's it's the largesse of the ECB uh, over the years that has allowed for them to stay afloat. Otherwise, they would have imploded, and still we can get better rates in the U.S. That's yeah, that's right, and yeah. and a lot of that has been down to you know kind of the differential and and monetary policy uh, that the Fed has been more more aggressive in raising rates than uh, the other central banks. Uh, partly because they feel like they can, because the economy can kind of withstand that um, and it is a way to try and bring inflation down. Um, but then also, yeah, that Europe has sort of structural problems and then also had a lot of problems from more problems from COVID and the you know, energy problems they had, um, you know, with their war in Ukraine and everything else. They had some sort of specific issues that they're dealing with as well. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that uh, they have a weaker economy and so they have in some ways lower rates, partly because of that. Um, and so, yeah, I think people are not expecting that sovereign debt in, in Europe will, um, you know, will not get paid. I mean, there'll be, uh, 
uh, the, the money will still be good, but that there's going to be you know more risk there uh, economically, and that they're, they're probably going to have to lower rates at some point to try to stimulate uh, more so than the U.S. So once we get past what the Fed does and the expectations versus reality, we can try to think about, I think, fundamentals and try to understand maybe one day we'll get back to pure fundamentals as opposed to all the things that are ahead of it. Because really, if, if, if anybody that I know that's worth their weight in, you know, in, 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 in feathers for that matter, uh, is, is always looking for the day that we can get back to dealing with what are the real values of a company based on whatever particular metric or calculus that you want to use, right? Whether it's a discounted dividend model or discounted cash flow, or what do you want to use? I don't know, a relative PE, whatever. I don't care. I don't care what it is. The problem is that it's been so twisted for 15 years now because of the excessive amount of bailouts, stimulus, low interest rates, lower, lower interest rates. When things go bad, everybody just gets like, a momentary shock like we had the the mysterious and 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 minor bank implosion of March of 2023 that seemingly ended within 2 weeks like there was no there was no add on effect there was nothing nothing happened and why because we said okay God, whoa, we have a solution just hide the bonds just keep just put them on the books as full value we didn't think of that, and that's why those two other banks went under. But now that we thought of it, eh, just put them on as full value at the maturity value. But fundamentals are important. And we look at something like an Apple. And, and I focus on Apple because I think it's one of the poster child for so many different things. It's a poster child for, you know, a love affair by investors. It's a poster child for buy and hold. It's a poster child for um, aged innovation that's just no longer there. It's also, I think, central to the idea of fundamentals of where a company has actually missed earnings and revenues and it's gone down their growth rate over the last number of quarters, but yet the stock stayed elevated through the entirety of 2023. Can you give me an explanation on that, Sam? Um, yeah, I mean, only partly in some sense. I think um, there's a definitely been a demand for you know, the kind of highly liquid, um, you know, large cap growth type stocks uh, in the U.S., uh, both in the U.S. And, and globally. So it's one of those, like, you know, I remember, remember the expression of nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. This is the same thing. Nobody ever got fired for buying Apple um, nowadays. Um, and so I think, you know, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the earnings, you know, kind of uh, drivers, earnings estimates and things like that have not been very good for, you know, most of the last year. And um, and but the multiple has held up. And I think, you know, that's partly just because it's still, you know, a bit, you know, the, the biggest one of the biggest companies that makes lots of money. Um, and people think it might be able to, you know, keep doing that. Um, and there aren't many companies that are that are like that and that have the same size and liquidity uh, to get in and out of. So I think a lot of it is an attraction to the kind of just uh, the ease of, of owning a stock like that. And same thing for a lot of the other big cap tech stocks like Microsoft and and so forth. Um, that, that they're the easiest thing to own, um, both in the U.S. and globally, uh, and so it's you know it's hard to, to convince people not to own them uh, and to take money out and to put into yeah. something smaller and potentially riskier. Well, last um, week we saw two downgrades, which is kind of unusual. But one of the things that I really th thought was fascinating was when you look back and you see over the last year that Apple bought back six percent of their shares, goosed their earnings. Right, goose their earnings per share, rev per share too, but not you know you don't look at revenue usually that way, but you look at EPS that way, right? Goosed all of that, and still, could you imagine, Sam, if they didn't do that? Well, right, yeah, I know a lot of the big tech companies. I mean, they, they make more money than they have a have a good use for right now, and so they they, they buy back their stock. I mean, in addition to whatever dividend they might be paying, they uh, they they, they want to be able to you know kind of give some of that back to shareholders without having to, to maintain a high dividend over the long run. And so buybacks are the, are the way they do that. And so yeah, Apple has been one of the biggest uh, for, for, for sure. Um, so they're very profitable. Uh, they make lots of money and, and that's, you know, flowing through, but um, yeah, the question is, do they have, you know, high growth prospects looking forward after all the things that have happened so far? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a, a, a good fundamental view on Apple itself. Uh, but I, I do see the fact that it's it's not really producing the same kind of earning surprises that it used to. Um, and so it may have some uh, 
you know, some multiple contraction to, to work through. What, let, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about, you know, the, the expectations of what's gone going on, the outlook. I think that you think that, you know, the economy and earnings is going to kind of hold up well. You mentioned that earlier, that it's got to, we're going to hang in there. It may not be like extraordinary, but it's going to hang in there. So one of the things that I really wonder, maybe you could help me with, um, put on your CFA hat here, how mm-hmm. with the inflation that we saw and the higher prices that we witnessed across every part of the entirety of the supply chain from uh, from pre to post, right? You know, from manufacturing to, to consumer. But, but in the manufacturing side of it and the cost factors, how is it that margins seem to hold up? Yeah, I know you're right. I think that um, there's been for a little while now uh, that the cost side, you know, things like commodities, the underlying, you know, kind of, you know, base uh, load things that uh, that go into to building things have come down quite a bit. Uh, but the the final consumer prices uh, maybe have come down less, and so that's allowed some you know companies to maintain their margins. Uh, some are, of course, you know, big like technology or in places and um, some you know healthcare and things like that that are more uh, that that don't have a lot that have their more of their costs are either labor or are they just have high margins in general have been able to maintain them uh, because there is demand for. Uh, you know, either AI or labor-saving things or technology as a way to uh, for other companies to you know kind of keep their their, their earnings up. So I think there's been uh, partly a structural shift toward the the, the sectors of the economy that have high margins, um, and also the fact that some of the underlying uh, you know kind of costs uh, from from commodities and things like that have fallen faster than consumer prices have. So at least temporarily, that's allowed uh, companies like consumer staples and things like that to hold some of their margins up. Uh, that won't last forever, but I think that that, that has been a help, um, and it's been very volatile the last few years with, with prices kind of surging and then stabilizing, and some of them coming down um, now while others held up. It, it's been a very d- dynamic and dramatic move, um, and so companies are trying to take advantage of it as best they can. Uh, so you see that more in some sectors than others, but I think it's come through in earnings uh, overall. Looking out more towards 2024, and what could go wrong? You know, what, what kind of things could be a problem from a macro standpoint? Um, we have a, another debt ceiling. Hello. We're once again, down the road uh, a few weeks from now. But what is that? Is that is that something? Uh, I don't know. Is, is, is um, you know, we had the Inflation Reduction Act, <laughs> which was supposed to stimulate the economy and somehow pour money into it and at the same time reduce costs which makes no sense. But okay, we had that in 2023. I don't think there's a lot of stimulus on the, I don't think there's a lot of discussion right now, even though we're entering into a presidential election year. I don't think there's a lot of stimulus discussion right now. Uh, Congress seems to be pulling back. What do you make of all that? Yeah, no, you're right. I don't think we're probably going to get a lot of new kind of fiscal stimulus in 2024, like we had in, in 22 and 23. Um, I think that those some of those those plans that you know the Chips Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act, I think those have been very helpful in offsetting basically the Fed's tightening and helping a lot of the manufacturing, construction, you know, technology related uh, spending that we're seeing. A lot of factories are being built and things like that, which in the long run will help expand uh, productive capacity um, and help you know kind of bring supply on, uh, increase supply, and therefore reduce uh, inflation. Um, yeah, in the short term, it, it can be a mixed uh, kind of a thing. But I think um, that's been one of the reasons why the U.S. economy has held up better than other economies, uh, because we have had that kind of fiscal support to balance out tighter monetary policy. Um, typically, in a cycle like this, you would see uh, the Fed raising rates and uh, fiscal policy getting tighter, you know, people worrying about the deficit and things like that. And when you have both of those things going in the kind of slowing direction, that's when you start to get uh, weak economies and, and recession talk. Um, I think it's been much more balanced this year and maybe, you know, coming or 2023 and, and 2024, uh, but without anything new coming along, uh, some of that's going to kind of fade away and, and, and wear itself out uh, and has been more priced in uh, to just stocks and bonds. So I think, um, yeah, you're right. It's given the way Congress is, it's unlikely to be any big new spending plans. Um, hopefully they don't do anything that would really aggressively cut spending too quickly, because I think that would probably hurt the economy, uh, given where we are right now. But overall, I think uh, if we kind of keep things stable, the economy should be okay. I think we got enough momentum coming into the year uh, to keep us going for a little while. But uh, I think you can, 
you, you shouldn't expect, yeah, a lot of new stimulus coming along. I mean, in fact, I, I got to scratch my head and wonder, you know, the Fed is supposed to be cutting back on their quantitative easing and turning into quantitative tightening and reverse repos and to, you know, take that out of the market and take this out of the market. And I just wonder where that, that point is, because I think they could continue trying to do so because it allows them f to, to reload for the next time, right? There will be a next time. There's going to be mm -hmm. something down the road that something goes awry. It's probably going to be in the banking sector because it always is, you know, the bad banksters. Um, but it seems to me they, they need to aggressively try to pull back when they can right now. And when I say pull back is to um, not so much rates, 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 rates is, is a different animal. I think the amount of, of that they have on their balance sheets, right? That needs to be unloaded because that was the most effective part. Rates down were great, but, but quantitative easing, I mean, we're talking about an immediate transmission of all sorts of money into the markets. And now one of the things that's going on is since March of 2023, there was a great arbitrage, you know, where the Fed window was closed down, but that other deal that was opened up where the banks were allowed to go and and and, and uh, get emergency funding, although it doesn't look like emergency funding, and then arbitrage it for like maybe a half a point. That's going on still to this day, which allows for the banks to stay extraordinarily liquid and to, you know benefit from some of the money they put put on the street. But, you know, if we have um, the Congress probably not spending and the Fed slowing down, I mean, I don't know, the, the, the idea that everybody's thinking that the Fed is going to start reducing and maybe five to six cuts over the next year, does that seem logical to you? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think people may have kind of jumped a little bit ahead of where a little Fed bit is like a little be. bit. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I do think that there's probably a justification, a pretty good reason to to you know bring rates down a little bit at least from where they are. If, as I expect, that you know the kind of underlying inflation rate gets down closer to that two percent rate that they're looking for, and by some measures it's very close to that already. Um, I think that having a five and a half percent policy rate is, is 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 probably too high. You don't need it to be that high. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could you could back off you know, 50 or 100 basis points easily and still have a reasonably, you know, restrictive or, you know, kind of non-accommodative uh, monetary policy, uh, but without having rates, you know, as high as they are right now. And I think, you know, people think back to like 1995 was kind of the last time we had what you could call a, uh, you know, a, a rate cut cycle, or you know, I think there were maybe three rate cuts then, um, where inflation was coming down, but you didn't have a recession or a banking crisis or anything else that would kind of force them to. It was it was more of a, uh, you know, something they could choose to do rather than be forced to do. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, the economy and stocks did very well in the late 90s. So um, I think in some degree people are starting to think about that. But, um, yeah, I think that I think the balance sheet stuff, the QE and QT, I think that has probably less impact on the overall economy and the markets than people give it credit for. Um, I think it's a good signal of what the Fed is kind of thinking about. But. Mostly, it's just more the plumbing of the underlying the banking system that it affects um, more than the markets as a whole or the economy as a whole. Um, I think rates have some impact, but probably again less than people think that they do. I think fiscal policy gets uh, kind of underrated, and I think monetary policy gets overrated uh, in the grand scheme of things in terms of uh, overall policy shifts. But I think a lot of it has been just you know external things, whether it's you know wars and pandemics or OPEC or whatever. Those all have a lot more impact on on inflation in particular um, than than you know tweaks of twenty five basis points here and there on, on the Fed funds rate mm -hmm. or what they're doing with their balance sheet. I think those are are sort of more small things that uh, um, don't have as big an impact as people like to think. Even though the Fed gets a lot of attention and, and oh, God, I'm so sick of them. By the way, it's enough of them. You, you've been yeah. doing this how long? Twenty something years? Yeah, yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I'm almost double. I'm almost double you. And I got to tell you something. The, the 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 parade of Fed speakers, the non-voting, the voting, the this one, the that one, the hawk, the dove, the thing, the, this said this and that one. It is, an, honestly, this was all started, well, it, it's been started a while, but Bern, under Bernanke, I really, you know, the communications policy that they had, which is basically carrot and stick. That's all that is. It's to try to lead you to where you want to go. And you could see that by them coming out with a dovish comment, then backing up with a, with a, it, it, it's the secret handshake club of, of going out and saying, Hey, you know what? You know what? We've done too much over there. Too much. Go over and just yeah, calm it down a little bit. But I want to get back to 95s, 96, 97, 98 time period. You know, that, that particular cycle 
was very good for value oriented. That was the banks. That was your utilities. That was all that. That was into, into 19, uh, the, the late nineties. Then it switched over to, to, of course, to, to technology, you know, back in 98 and a half to 99. And then it all came down in 2000, of course, because, but, but, but before that it was all, it was all value. Uh, growth in tech was in the doghouse. It was nothing. And, um, you know, kind of an interesting thing that may be playing out. Let's go back to um, uh, what you don't like. So we know what you like. We know where you stand. Uh, my notes from our conversations back and forth is that you're not particularly uh, thrilled about China or Europe. Now, I'm going to just right. say one thing before you even start. Sure. I'm with you on Europe. I've never been fond of Europe. It's something you got to have a piece of because you never know where they're going to go. It's just, you don't want to overweight. China, I find a little interesting. And I'll tell you why. Everybody hates China. We hate China because of they didn't restart. We hate China because we hate China. We hate China because everybody else hates China. We hate China because um, th the stock market is in the toilet, the worst in I don't know, year, five years. It's, it's down to lows. Um, we hate China because of all the things that are going on politically, which, by the way, if we go back to one of the first things we talked about, which is only a few good things actually have to happen. <laughs> only a couple of things. Maybe a little stimulus. Maybe China says, you know what? We're going to leave Taiwan alone for a while. I don't know. It could be very dramatic for China stocks. That's my two cents. Please rip me apart. <laughs> um, no, you're right. I think there's, there's definitely kind of a sentiment question towards China um, that you definitely want to keep in mind in the sense if everybody hates something, then yeah, there's a definitely the, the more potential for any any good thing to come along and and, and kind of push prices the other way. Um, you know, more of what I'm looking at is just the uh, kind of the more bottom up earnings estimates uh, that I track for uh, Chinese stocks relative to all the other stocks in the world. Um, and what I've been finding for quite a while now and still am is that um, earnings estimates are being cut even after all the cuts we've already had. They're still being cut much more aggressively uh, for Chinese stocks uh, than for anything anywhere else in the world, almost. <clears throat> which tells me that um, whatever's going on in kind of the headlines, the macro GDP numbers, and whatever else, which are always a little sus suspect, um, the underlying corporate profitability for people who are going to be shareholders in Chinese companies uh, just isn't there still. That there's no uh, fundamental kind of you know turn or tailwind there to to to, to hold on to right now. Now it could happen. And maybe they come along with some kind of unexpected stimulus or something like that. But uh, given the way their fiscal situation is um, and you know, the debt issues they have and real estate and things like that, I think they have a lot less scope to do big stimulus now than they did even say in like 2015, 16, when they did some uh, or in past cycles, when they've really been able to come in and aggressively you know, throw money at their economy and, and it had then effects globally. Um, I think that the fact that commodities are coming down still um, you know, oil is under pressure. A lot of other metals have been under pressure. Um, that's because the demand from China isn't there. So when I look at kind of global activity and I look at Chinese earnings estimate revisions, um, <clears throat> for the most part, I don't see any signs of a significant turn in the uh, the fundamentals that would make me think that uh, you know China is getting better um, or even significantly less less bad at this point. Um, but I'm always you know kind of open to the idea that uh, at some point, yeah, things will get bad enough. Sentiment will be get, get negative enough that you'll you'll just have you know uh, an opportunity for a rally, um, whether it's a long term structural change or it's going to be a six months and then roll back over again. It's it's hard to say, um, but yeah, they do face a lot of kind of big picture headwinds. Uh, their demographics aren't great. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of other structural issues they're facing. So um, I want to see a little more proof before I, I want to start to jump in there. Um, so my my kind of counter is that the other parts of emerging markets look more attractive than China does. So yeah. if you want to take some yep. EM risk, I wouldn't look to China. I would look at like maybe India, Taiwan, even um, other parts of, of the EM yeah, space. Vietnam as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's definitely opportunities there if you think you want to take a little more of that risk outside of the developed world. Yeah. I'm looking at this though, as a, a, a with some political issues coming up and all that it just seems to me that there's, you know, the potential for an opportunity of, of, of a, Near-term, re reasonable rebound as people are looking for value, especially as what we're seeing this year, as people are saying, hey, you know what, maybe I, th these things ran up a little bit too much, and we're going to take a little chips off the table, let's find some other value. Speaking of which, you know, I know that you still like tech and you like financials, you know, underweight commodities, 
and most defensive sectors. But um, what what about like energy? I mean, again, uh, the potential for a, a flare up in the Mid East is more than high. I mean, it's everybody's getting involved with their ships. It's like you know, again, war games going on here, and everybody's looking. They're looking for action. You know, we're not. They're looking for a way, and they see weakness in the U.S. U.S. part. They see that the world's sentiment has turned against Israel, which, by the way, is very good for anybody that's, you know, against Israel, of course. And you got Iran now starting to say, you know what? Oh, okay, you know, you you, you shot the little Houthi guys in their little little boats. We're coming after you with our destroyers. And, and you know, there's been, I think, too much simmering under the surface with regard to the animosity and disgust and, and just total um, lack of trust of what's gone on over the years between, you know, U S and Iran, that there, there's a potential for something there. Oh yeah, you're right. I think that's been, you know, the kind of a lot of people's focus lately. Um, now, I guess to start with, I should say, yeah, that I've, I've been underweight, uh, the commodity sectors, energy and materials. Um, and uh, I, I, my general view has been kind of negative on uh, oil and, and energy commodities in general, natural gas and other things as well. Um, and in part, because all the things that you mentioned about the Middle East and everything else, um, those are the sort of events that should make oil go up. Um, and they, they do occasionally, there'll be jump, little jumps in the oil price, and then it goes back down again. And so when I'm looking at it from kind of a, either a, an investor sentiment or kind of a price behavior standpoint, um, if you give a, a market a reason to go up and, and then it kind of doesn't, it kind of, in my, the way my old boss used to say, it just, it acts badly. Like it wants to go down and occasionally gets a reason to go up and can't really maintain it. And so, so far it looks like there's still a lot of sellers of oil out there waiting for a rally to sell into uh, because the supply and demand underlying all this is still kind of skewed a little bit more towards supply. There's a lot of non-OPEC supply out there, including the US, um, that's come on. And I think that's that way. And there's not much demand growth, particularly, you know, including China, but also in the developed world um, as people are kind of gradually moving away from, from using as much oil. And so, you know, in my mind, I'm not seeing the kind of price action um, that I would expect to see if I really thought that what's going on in the Middle East and things were a, a, uh, a we're going to give oil a reason to rally. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I still think, though, that we can keep at least, if nothing else, the, the if, if the economy stays, if we don't go into recession and all that, it still seems like we're not going to see a massive sell off in oil considering that and the fact that we have. Uh, and if China comes back a little bit, I mean, there's a lot of ifs, right? A lot of ifs. <laughs> but, uh, you know, right. if that happens and if on top of it all of that, uh, you know, the Middle East maintains a, a contentious zone. So any parting mm -hmm. words, any things you want to say, tell people where to get the information on you. Tell me what you got. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the millstreetresearch.com, uh, the website has uh, a lot of, you know, sample reports and, and background. Uh, also, there's a blog uh, there that I update periodically. Uh, you can subscribe to you, just drop your email in there and get updates uh, of the blog with all kinds of different commentary, you know, mostly macro uh, kind of market related stuff. Uh, and then the Twitter feed uh, at Mill Street Research on Twitter and uh, on LinkedIn. I post there periodically. You'll, you'll be able to see kind of, um, you know, uh, comments, you know, most most days about uh, kind of the outlook and some of the indicators and charts and things that I look at. Good stuff. Sam Burns, CFA from Mill Street Research. Thank you for joining me. And I want to wish you a very happy and successful start to 2024, my friend. Thanks very much for having me on, uh, and uh, best wishes to you as well for this year. Thanks. See ya. And best wishes to all of you. Thanks for listening to this show, this episode, the start of 2024. It's going to be a great year. Let me tell you something. It's going to be a great year of guests. We are booked out through, I think, May at this time. The show has really gained some popularity again this year, and uh, guests are just really coming at us and, 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 and saying, hey, you know, and we weed them out, of course. But we have some great names coming on. I'm very excited. But next week, Vitaly Katzenelson. He's a value guy. And what's really cool about that is that when we look at the current market environment, everybody wants the growth. They want the tech. They want the, you know, the biotech, all this stuff that's screaming and buying and moving. And sometimes we forget about value. One of the things that may come into play in 2024, I dare say, as a real play, so we're going to have him on next week. Be sure to turn tune in. Be sure to tell everybody that you know about the show and make sure they tune in. If you need me, you want to find me, if you want to talk, if you want to review your portfolio, now's the time, as I always say in the beginning of the year, uh, let's get together.
Go over to the disciplineinvestor.com, click on the contact us, ask Andrew, send us a little quick note saying, hey, let's get together and we'll do that. Thanks for joining me this week. Thanks for joining me every week. I'm going to bid you adieu right now and uh, hopefully you have a great week ahead. I'll see you real soon. Nothing discussed in this podcast should be considered a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Past performance is no indication of future results. In addition, the information presented is not intended to be used as a sole basis of any investment decisions, nor should be construed as advice designed to meet the individual needs of any particular investor. Nothing herein constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice, or individually tailored investment advice. Remember, investing involves substantial risk. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results and a loss of original capital may occur. No one receiving or accessing this information should make any investment decision without first consulting his or her own personal financial advisor and conducting his or her own research and due diligence, including carefully reviewing any applicable prospectuses, press releases, reports, and other public filings of the issuer of any securities being considered. Please consider this for educational purposes only. As always, use your best judgment when investing. Horowitz & Company, Inc. is registered as an investment advisor with the state of Florida and conducts business in other states where it is properly registered or is excluded from registration requirements. Registration does not imply any level of skill or training. Advertisements are not related to the host or affiliates and are not considered recommendations by the host of the show or any affiliates of Horowitz & Company.